Nicola joined him two years later, contributing topics related to cycling and walking in Korean cities. So without further ado, let's welcome to this uh, two speakers tonight. Thanks everyone, thanks for coming along on this cold night. Um, I wasn't expecting so many people. Uh, thank you for that introduction. So, as mentioned, uh, I started Kojix.com in 2011, um, and it really just started as um, a project of mine, as, as, like a, a blog. Um, I'd been living in Korea since 2007, and during my time here, I'd kind of noticed all these projects going on around the place. You know, pretty much everywhere you look in Korea, there's a construction site, there's a crane, there's always something going on. And so, basically, this led me to kind of investigate what these projects were, and a lot of that led me to find that a lot of them were transport-related projects, especially uh, new subway lines, cycleways, things like that. Um, and so I just started this blog as I, as I began looking into these projects to kind of uh, uh, inform people, but also to get uh, information out there, especially to expats in Korea. Um, I found that a lot of expats had like the wrong or incorrect information um, about certain projects, or they just weren't aware. Um, and so uh, I began writing that, and then later on uh, Nicola came on board and we started doing it together and it kind of grew from there. Um, and we've uh, kind of developed an audience from uh, many different, uh, not just from people in Korea, but also um, from people all, all over the world, people working in the industry, um, uh, also uh, visitors to Korea. Uh, last year we kind of relaunched the website and made it look uh, quite new uh, and we added some more things to it. So whereas before it was just kind of a, a blog and news, and news, we kind of added some other things, uh, a project database so you can search for all the different uh, bits of transport in Korea, uh, transport uh, discussion forum for talking about transport, um, and this one, which is really important, a uh, guide to public transport in and around Korean cities. So now we get a lot of visitors um, who are coming to Korea. Actually, a lot of Korean websites, they haven't, um, if you're looking for information on Google, for example, e even the Incheon International Airport, information is really hard to find through Google sometimes. And so we just want to make that information a lot easier to access. Uh, so. Uh, we're also active on social media, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, so, this is our website, um, and as mentioned, we get a lot of interest uh, from uh, people all over the world, people reaching out to us, um, who are also interested in Korean transport. And yes, like um, Andy said, we are active on social media. That's for example our Facebook page where you can maybe like post links to our most recent articles. We post um, links to any news articles or, or um, uh, media articles related to transportation or development in Korea. And also we share pictures and videos on, on there. Also we have Twitter, and Google, uh, YouTube, and Google Plus. And now to start the topic, first like as an icebreaker and to open this, this um, presentation, I want to ask you who uses public transportation in Korea and Seoul at least once a day? Can you please raise your hand? Okay, it's a huge majority. And then now compared to your place where you maybe previously lived or your home country, do you use public transport more? Like, who of you? uses public transport more often here in Korea than they've done back home. Can you raise hand? Okay, also it shows what I've more or less expected. So, and it's also like what our topic, like our presentation is about like public transportation, how we, that we use it and how it developed over the years. And 
for to understand the sort of development how everything like, evolved over the years. There's a very interesting concept by the transport researcher Paul Walter. He's from Australia, but uh, based in, in Singapore, and he does lots of studies in Asian cities, or also in many other cities around the world related to transportation and parking. And he made this basic concept that every city, like every or like it's every town, which is like not a lot of economic activity, which is small, and not many has not many places to go to, is more or less like a walking city. You have short distances, you can walk to any place you want. But then with growing prosperity, with economic activities, then people have to go somewhere. So it means walking is not enough. And usually then we will have um, non-motorized cities where people can use bicycles or other rickshaws or other forms of transportation. Then if this growing demand in, in transportation, if it's growing economic activity with growing distances isn't met with public transportation, then we are going to end, or like not end, but then we are going to develop into a motorcycle city. That you can see, for example, in Vietnam, Vietnam, Hanoi, and Ho Chi Minh City are very famous examples. 30 years ago, there have been like non-motorized transport cities and bicycle heavens. Now, they are like motorcycle cities. And then, if this trend continues, we will actually end up to have our American, North American model of car cities, very heavy, large infrastructure uh, that costs a lot of money, and everybody not only has a car, but everybody needs a car to, to get to their destinations or to their places. However, this of course, you see this blank, there's some alternative pathways. So, from a working city or from a non motorized city, a city like if the decision makers and policy makers, if they decide to promote public transportation and introduce buses and so on, then we shift the shift possible towards bus and often like private transit because if, if it's informal and um, still at the like, early stage of, of the development. And from there, there's still always the danger to go back into like car cities or if there's too high demand and the buses, especially bus cities, can't cope with this, then they will end up again as a car city. So it's very important to go from a bus city up to introduce mass transit, often like rail-based mass transit, and um, then in order to become a real transit city. Also, Paul Barter, the transport researcher, he <coughs> categorized the Seoul of the 1950s as a non-transport city, non-motorized transport city, and then the Seoul of today he sees as a transit city. Also, so our presentation today will only will like describe this path and then only focus on public transportation. You will maybe see, we don't talk about cars, we don't talk about uh, private motorization because that's not actually very important in Korea or in Seoul not. because if it's more if public transport doesn't work if suddenly the public transport system collapses then the whole city collapses but not if you don't have private cars but again they're more like interconnections so it's a very complicated model in, in, in the whole so now to start this topic we first will go to the past and um, start early 20th century. All right, so um, I promise we'll have a lot more pictures now. <laughs> um, so public transport was born in Korea in uh, May 1899 with uh, the tram in Seoul. So um, some people are familiar with that that there were trams and so some people um, don't know. Uh, but the trams were started, uh, they were actually the idea um, of two American businessmen, uh, Henry Colbran and Harry Bostwick. Um, and so they came uh, uh, over and they went and talked to Emperor Gojong. Um, he was emperor at that stage because this was during the Korean Empire just after 
the Chosun Dynasty. Um, although I've got a picture of a king in there because I prefer that. Um, so basically, uh, Colbrand and Bostwick, they met up with uh, <coughs> Gordon, Emperor Gordon, and they convinced him to build a tramway. They talked to him about the benefits and stuff, and so they went into a joint venture together. And part of that joint venture was also not just setting up a tram, but also setting up electric lighting in Seoul. Although it wasn't the first electric lighting in Seoul that came um, a few years before that. So, when the tram opened, uh, people went crazy basically, they loved it. Um, so the story goes that people came from all over the country to ride the tram, um, and there's also tales of some people giving up their livelihood, just giving up their job to just sit and ride on the tram all day. Um, because they loved it that much. So right here is uh, uh, the original tram. Uh, there were eight of them built, and plus one for the emperor, of course, his own private one. And so the first original tram was, you know, it was all made of wood, uh, no cushions or anything, very open. You can see also they um, also got advertising up here. This is some advertising for a Japanese medicinal pad, even back then. Um, so yeah, it was pretty popular. Um, but 10 days after the opening, um, something terrible happened. Um, with so many people um, fascinated by the tram, there were a lot of people on the streets. And while well, Seoul streets were busy at that time already with people and cattle and horse and carts and things, people weren't used to big vehicles coming down the road. And a five-year-old kid ran out in front of the tram and was hit and tragically killed. Now, of course, there were a lot of people on the road at the time who witnessed this, and they all went into a mob, into a frenzy. The father of the child went after the driver with an axe, and uh, although I think he got away, um, but they, the crowd did burn the tram to the ground, and then after that, I think they moved on. They went to attack the generator that they, they, uh, they didn't get there. Um, so yeah, I think there's a picture of the. Um, so this is kind of known as like the first accident, first uh, you know, public transport accident in Korea. So that's the picture of the burnt out train on the road. And so this was um, kind of a, a new site which people saw. This is another one I just added in there uh, from 1936 where a car got completely squished between two of the tramps. But the trams uh, went on to be very successful, and in uh, 1909, before the Japanese fully took over, in 1909, uh, Colbran went into talks with the Japanese uh, to sell the tram, and he sold the tram to the Japanese without telling the emperor. And when the emperor found out about this, he was furious. Uh, but by that time, Colbrand had gone back to London, where he was originally from, because um, he immigrated to the US earlier on. Um, but nothing much changed after that. The trams did go on to continue to be successful. Um, and this is a map of uh, what the tram network was like in 1936. So you'll recognize a lot of these names. You've got like uh, Seoul Station, City Hall, Itaewon, Nuryeongjin. Yongbinpur, a lot of these um, uh, major places in Seoul. And so it was really quite a, a good developed network. Um, in 1937, uh, there were about, uh, I think, 150,000 passengers a day. And while there were originally about eight trams when they first started, um, Later on, they had about 150, I think. Um, and it wasn't, Seoul wasn't the only city. Uh, also, Busan. They had trams for quite a long time as well. Um, and then also, at that time, Pyongyang too had, had trams from 1923 to 1950 uh, when the Korean War began. And then they actually, uh, the trams came back to Pyongyang in 1991. Um, and they're still running today. 
that's not to be confused with the trolley buses that run in Pyongyang as well. They started in uh, 1962. Uh, but back to Seoul. This is uh, some of the trams uh, after the Japanese left um, after World War II. So I think this is just before the Korean War up here. And these are the two from uh, 60s. So you can see the trams themselves, the vehicles, they developed quite a bit as well. Um, here's another one, 1963. Uh, some of you might have seen this tram uh, just down the road there, the Seoul Museum of History. That tram is from uh, the 1930s, from the Japanese era. Um, and it's been restored and that's a permanent display outside the Seoul Museum of History. So if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to, to go check it out. It's a good piece of history. Um, so, yes, uh, the tram was the most important um, public transport at that time. But if you uh, looked at some pictures directly after the liberation from Japan, before the Korean War, but there was maybe also a lot of people walking and cycling in, in the city. So, also here is a survey result um, where it, this, it leaves out tram, so maybe tram would make up 40% and then the other shares would be a little bit less. But according at least to this survey on main boulevards of, of Seoul, here walking, still many people are just on foot, and then cycling. Also, you can see like, oh, here the bicycle is inside the picture, so um, it was still like this, what I introduced earlier, like a non motorized city with transport for for quite a number of people but not not for everyone. And then came then there was the Korean War. After the Korean War the cities have to be reconstructed, the roads had to be repaired, the first also expansions began, the first um, highway construction also then was began in the sixties and seventies. And there was like a time where Buses have been introduced, taxi licenses have been distributed um, to operators, and suddenly, also here still, now we have also buses coming, they existed before, the Japanese introduced buses in the 1930s, but still like, um, you still can even see, can here see a bicycle in this picture. Then, just after the first survey, now 20 years later, we had lots of changes, here you can see how the buses are dominating. So it says public transport in, 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 in 1965, but actually like, taxi is not official public transport until today, it's not public transport, but here it was included in the survey. Um, and tram did only, like, tram decreased heavily and made only like less than a quarter of uh, trips. The majority of trips were then already made by, by bus. 1968 was the year when the tram service was discontinued. That's the last picture we can be able to see a traditional tram. Mostly out of the reasons that the city believed trams are too slow, they are not attractive enough, they don't um, provide the service needed for the city, and they have been mostly as obstacle. You know, they disturbed the traffic flow. Because now we had many taxis, we had lots of buses. We didn't have, at this time, no, there was no private motorization that came the, um, a decade later, uh, like 10 years later. But then, still you can, and they didn't, they saw like here, you know, we, see, we need the space actually for, for other transport buses, and not for tram. So, up until the first subway opening, it was the so-called era of buses. Because it was more or less the only public transport method. And then, probably you know about this, the, well, the female, like Anne Youngs, the female conductors, they've been more or less like the heart and the soul of this um, old-fashioned bus system. So they took care of collecting the fares, they took care of uh, the bus departure or stopping, so they, also a little bit funny, they screamed stop, like the English expression stop, to make the bus driver stop, 
or all right, or, or like all right, all right is like um, Kunglish type, uh, like Kunglish pre pronunciation to make the bus, uh, like the bus driver start again and go on to the school right. And then this was actually a very popular job. It was so-called one of the female jobs. I don't like the, I really don't, don't like this expression, but for this period, it was like a job for for women more more or less. And they recruited over seventeen thousand women throughout the years for this job. It didn't pay too well, but it was more or less because of um, pretty, like the requirements relatively low, um, and because you know Korean War and many. People couldn't afford to go to school, or couldn't. Uh, the circumstances allowed, so it was an opportunity for many women to be economically active and to work. But then, still, the bus service was not able to cope with this increase of population, with the growth of of, of Seoul or of the other cities in Korea. So, the bus service heavily decreased in quality. There was a lot, lot of waiting, a um, lot of huge crowds, and it was it's un like not really the best service. So, uh, buses weren't cutting it, uh, and they needed another solution. So, subways, of course. Uh, there actually had been plans uh, uh, during the 60s, I think during the 50s and even as far back as the 40s for subway lines uh, in Seoul, but they just kind of uh, sat on the table and nothing happened to them um, until uh, a mayor came along, Mayor Young Pichu, and he was previously the head of the Korean National Korean Railroad. So he knew the importance of rail and he got uh, started on this uh, pretty much straight away. Building Line 1 from 1971 to 1974. Um, so you can see a city hall there and Line 1 being constructed. And it was opened uh, in August 1974 um, which was supposed to be a day with a whole lot of events um, and festivities but on the day of the opening uh, the first lady was assassinated and so it kind of cast a, a shadow over this, this was probably the only event they held on the day um, and so it opened actually rather quietly uh, what is line one? so first of all you notice it's red because um, back then that was the colour of the line. It was also known as the Jongno Line. Um, 7.8 kilometres underground. And even though this was the subway section, at that time it still did connect to the rest of what we know as Line 1 today, going out to Incheon, down to Suwon, and also up to Songbo, which is today uh, Kwangwon University Station. Um, now, the underground section and the rest of the line, uh, they use different electricity. So if you've ever ridden on line one, you'll notice that as you, before you go into underground, the lights turn off and then come back on again. That's because it's switching electricity systems from uh, 25,000 volt AC electricity, which CoRail uses uh, for the rail network, to the 1,500 volt DC um, network underground. Now, when it opened, uh, there were in the first month there were 497 delays and faults, <laughs> so it didn't go that smoothly. But uh, it was still fairly well received because it connected uh, people in the um, kind of satellite cities. Uh, obviously, the purpose of the line was to kind of uh, get people out of their cars, reduce pollution a bit. Um, bridges stop people because people were just moving to Seoul at this stage. Uh, population was exploding. Um, um, 
and it continued to explode and it dealt with between the 1960s and 1970s. Um, from 200, I think it was from 255,000 to over 550,000. Um, and so after, after the line one, after line one opened in 1974, uh, that mayor, he left and a new mayor came in. His name was uh, Gu Jia Chun. So Mayor Gu, his, he was tasked with line two, um, which is, you know, when you think of the subway in Seoul, you really think of, of line two. Um, now he got started on this. At that time, there was still, there weren't really detailed plans for line two. Uh, all they knew was that they wanted a loop. And so Mayor Gu, he came in and Put a map on the table, got a coloured pencil, and he just went, oh yeah, we'll put it through here, through here, through here, through here. And in 20 minutes, he drew what we know today as line two. <laughs> and surprisingly, they built it that way, and it, yeah, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> so, it probably looked like something like this. Uh, now, even though it was a loop, it was built in stages. It wasn't built all at all once, so it was opened uh, over nearly four years, from 1980. And it started out from Shinsaldong. So in 1983 it looked like this. And obviously this Shinsaldong part here today is a little spur off. It's not actually part of the loop. The reason for that is because they needed to bring in uh, vehicles from the, the railroad. And so that connected to, to line one up there. So they, oops, they continued to build it and it was uh, opened, the full loop was opened in 1984. Um, and today it's uh, the most used subway line, 200 million passengers a day. Uh, and 30% of all subway travel happens on one tour. Uh, with some of the busiest stations as well, Shenbudim Station uh, and Kangnam Station, two really extremely busy stations. Um, now, uh, I think it was 1982, Seoul Metro came along and they began operating the underground section of Line 1, they began operating Line 2, and they picked up the plans for Line 3 and 4, and they finished construction on that, uh, and they both opened on the same day in 1985. So that's, uh, that's how they all opened up. So in 1990, this is how it looked, and which is, you know, it's pretty good compared to what they had 10, 10 years ago. Um, pretty good progress. And the next, uh, next plan was to build lines 5 to 8. And so that, uh, from construction to full opening, that took um, around 10 years. Now I won't go through every single line that has opened since then, because we'll be here forever. Um, but I just want to really emphasize how important, you know, the subway system is um, to Seoul. Um, it's, it's really the lifeline of Seoul that uh, makes up the largest mobile share, 37.1%. Um, compare this to my city of Auckland, where I'm from, where, um, you know, that would be the completely other way around. Cars would be up top, so um, I think it's a pretty impressive number. Um, one thing that's surprising in Korea is how even small delays on the Seoul subway network make news headlines. There was a 10 minute delay, it you know, makes news headlines. In New Zealand, the train can be cancelled and they'll, you know, <laughs> so, uh, It's also the sixth longest network in the world, uh, and will soon, in my opinion, it will soon be the fifth, um, taking over Moscow, because um, it just continues to grow. Um, yeah, if, if, the, if the Seoul Metro network, um, you know, for some freak reason shut down, it would be um, absolute chaos, basically. The number of passengers that use it each day is just phenomenal. Yes, uh, in the meantime, well, if, let's get back to the sad story of the buses. Uh, so now, some way to the majority of trips, the service of Buses decreased through the decades. You can see here how 
downwards trend from 70s up until it's now 95, but then Andy shot the previous slide, it even went down to 28% or really uh, to the second most important public transport mode in Korea. And there have been lots of issues in the 1970s with buses and it was a huge financial burden for the city. So if you spend a lot of money on, on such a such, um, service and then some of the solutions or ways to solve this, this issue is then by prioritizing this, this service. So so they've done this. Um, they prioritized the service in 1972 but it actually made things worse. <laughs> Here, this picture is not only about the issues of buses. In the 1990s, we had a peak of cars in, in Seoul, like, uh, the car ownership rapidly increased, and we had cars everywhere. The big show also of driving uh, cars in, in Seoul during that time, or until today, it's everybody sits alone in their car, everybody's driving alone, it's taking a lot of space. But back in the 1990s, you can see the where's the bus stop. The bus stop is out oh, here, some on the right. But the buses they can't even access, even if they wanted to. But actually, they didn't even want to get close to the bus stop because. So you have to understand the buses have been operated by private companies, and, and passengers means money. The more passengers they get, the more money they earn, and. The victims of this system were an elderly and young children. So, like the elderly, because they take a lot of time to get on the bus, and the bus driver didn't, didn't even thought about waiting for them. He just took as much like you know, like, like uh, fit people, and then tried to overtake the other buses to get first to the next bus stop in order to get more people on the bus. And then another issue is also um, if it's, it's privately run, they can choose wherever they want to operate. Of course, then they choose the main streets, the main big roads, where they can expect lots of passengers, but nobody, no bus went to the outskirts or to areas where there are less people, but maybe more people who need public transport don't have cars or anything, or other alternatives. So, in order to solve this issue, then Seoul took it, took it again back, again from this private, organized bus system, they took it again into public hands. And that's more or less, let's now we come to the second part of our presentation, to the present. Um, what we have until today, what we can see until today, is the so-called public transport reform. It was implemented in 2004. They done previous reforms in 97, and that failed in 97. They've done trial runs of this public transit reform in 2003 in one small area, but it failed as well. But then the implementation of the whole of the like, system in the whole city was quite su successful. And now, in, to this reform, Seoul um, took it back into their hands. They decided where buses have to operate, and which frequency, and how many services are each day until what, what time of day. While private companies just had to take care of, you know, of the buses, maintaining the buses, uh, paying the drivers, collecting the fares, but the fares were also then um, even then the third, third entity, the smart card company, who then distributed the money, including subsidies, in order to make this still profitable. And then this public transit reform had four main features. The first one, um, medium bus lanes. So these days, well, like, to this reform, uh, to reform, in order to get on some buses, we, it's not, we, don't, we don't take the bus on the side of the road, we have to get on the center of the road, on the small islands, uh, like bus island pl bus for, uh, platforms, and from there, take bus. And the good thing is, even if there's traffic, the bus usually then just has their own lane and can pass by all this car traffic. This system is the so-called bus rapid transit, BRT system. 
and it was first introduced in 1974 in the Brazilian city of <coughs> Curitiba. And so they looked at Curitiba, and this is like the best practice of this bus rapid transit, and they then took this concept of the median bus lanes. Here you can see the similarities. Like they also have um, median, median bus lanes. Here, it's even the streets are very wide. It's a city with a million people, so and a lot of space. So they can even have two lanes per um, per direction. The difference here is, for example, here you pay, like in Curitiba, you pay to get into the platform, and you don't pay when you get on the bus. It's, so it resembles more like a um, subway system. You enter the system here, then you get on the bus, and then you can transfer easily between buses. Korea didn't do this, first of all, because there's not a complete network of the system. You know, sometimes the buses still take passengers from the side of the road. And then when the system was introduced in 2004, we already had smart card system, which is actually quite a quick way to pay for public transportation. The second feature of this re reform is the color coding and the c categories of buses. You now, as you all know, like blue, green, red, and yellow buses. The yellow buses are most, can, there are just dozens of them, where we like circular buses in very small areas. Blue buses are the so called trunk buses. They go through half of the city, almost from one end to another. The green Buses are so-called feeder buses. They feed into the subway system. So they pass by as many subway stops as possible. So I would also recommend you, if you are lost and you just want to find the subway system as fast as possible, just get on, on a green bus and it will lead you more or less to, to at least one or two stations. Um, and the red buses are connecting you know, Seoul and other cities of Seoul. And this system is also taken from Curitiba. Curitiba has the same color coding. They also use the same blue buses for even have articulated buses, something that we don't have here in Seoul. Um, but red buses for the express buses, like also green for the like district buses and so on. The third element is the smart card system. So we now we have just a card to pay for everything, and only for the transport bus, but also for uh, convenience stores of any, like, t or even for taxi or phone booths and so on. And actually, uh, that was for that. Korea, uh, Seoul was the first city in the world to introduce a chip based payment system for public transportation. And that was already in 1996 with the UPASS. So it was like the first kind in the world. And since then, the smart card system is a little bit. Um, an upgraded version of this because it's integrated and can be used anywhere and it's even exported to many cities around the world to New Zealand and to um, South America and other many many other places. The fourth element is the real-time information system. It's and it's probably for the user one of the most important things because if you, you know, if you compare the like several studies comparing if you don't know when your bus arrives, and you know when your bus arrives, the waiting time, you know, for when you don't know, is much longer. And it's more uncomfortable. You really don't know when yeah, it, it will come. And it's very inconvenient. So knowing it will come in four minutes feels really, really good. And or like knowing, oh, actually it doesn't operate yet because it's a night bus so during the day. It's not yet operating. With the information system. There's a whole um, control center, so-called topless system. I've never been there actually, I would love to go there once, but it looks, it looks really amazing. And they not only manage bus system, or like bus times, they manage the whole traffic, you know, or like construction sites, and all the traffic flow, speeds, they, they have all information in this, and then they distribute it, they make it possible for us to have it on the smartphone, or on, on the internet, on websites, and so on. So that's... The result of this public transport reform, uh, like the official name is public transport reform, but it was more like a bus reform, except for the smart card system, it was also in introduced for subways. Most of the measures are aimed 
to improve the bus system, to improve the bus service. And so it was, as I said, 2004, somewhere around here. And the only thing you could see like after it's decreasing for many years, now um, the share of buses is more or less stabilized. And since then it's on a relatively same level. Because there's still like a lot of issues, for example, um, as I said earlier, there are just medium bus lanes, so there should be a network of medium bus lanes. They're not connected well. Like here, this, this map, or this light blue, or yellow, or red sections are actually gaps, gaps of, in the system. And or, or they, they don't exist yet. And it says complete in this year, but they're not complete, they're not even um, being planned. So, to have a real like, you know, BRT, medium bus lane network, you need to connect all of these different routes and different ma major road points. And then, this is not a problem, problem these days anymore, but it was at the beginning. They changed to this new system without reducing the number of buses. And because the bus was still very important and there have been so many operators who still wanted to be part of this new system. There were like, huge traffic jams on this lane, so also like it shows a little bit that the limitation of what buses can actually move and transport. And even there's some funny pictures, like saying maybe it's not, you know, like even the players, Lehman Bach, who like the one who introduced this public transit reform, that is saying like it's not. Isn't it maybe like just a defense wall in StarCraft? Or anything? So it's not, is it really moving? It's kind of making jokes of it. And then the underlying reason for all of this and why we have subway systems and what now Andy is going to, to, to us introduce to us is because buses have limitations and, and limited um, capacity. So while private cars are of course the worst in terms of how many people can be moved per hour and cycling is actually quite well and if you look at cost it's the best mode because you don't much infrastructure but the buses are somewhere here and then a real mass transit subway or like dedicated uh, rail even on the streets this can move much more people than than just a uh, normal bus, bus system. So. Alright, so um, again, buses have improved, but uh, still not always the answer. Um, now you might have noticed in the past few years uh, around Korea with some lines opening up, that they're not necessarily uh, subway or even uh, rail lines. Uh, since 2011, eight, uh, seven or eight different uh, light rail lines around the country have actually opened. It's more than normal, you know, standard subway or, or rail lines. Um, so there's been a real rise uh, of light rail around the country. Now the first one that was set to open uh, was the spectacular failure that was the Waimito Monorail. Now this was uh, a project that was uh, supposed to open in 2010, I believe. Uh, it was supposed to rejuvenate the Wamigo area, which was getting a bit aged, and people weren't going there as, as much as they did. And so people were pretty excited for this. And it was kind of plagued with problems from the start, uh, problems during testing, and then the final, final nail in the coffin was during a test, uh, a bit of the monorail fell off and injured a woman. Um, all of my stories involved people getting injured. Um, and finally, earlier this year, this, is, this photo is from August this year, uh, it was finally removed without operating even once, um, even though it was completed in 2010. Um, but not all hope is lost. This funny looking thing um, is going to replace it. So rather than um, a vehicle which can take many people, some type of tourist venture, has, um, I guess, said, hey, we can do something with this. Um, and so they're going to try and use the line. So that's supposed to be opening next year, but yeah, again, we'll see. 
Uh, now the next one that was supposed to open after that was the Everline, which was also completed in 2010, didn't open until 2013. Just sat there, um, hanging over the city for three years, doing nothing because of problems um, between the, the city and the company. So light rail actually didn't really get off to a, a great start. Um, these are the new, new lines that have been opened over the past, uh, past few years, since 2011. Uh, obviously, for some we're doing right, they opened the first two in the same year, Kusan Line 4, and uh, they came out Kusan Light Rail Transit. Um, and you can see the other ones there, Wichang Gu Yu Line, Yong Neva Line, Sunchang PRT, uh, Taken Monorail. Now, I've got Inchang Maglev, and some of you might say, hey, that's not light rail, and um, that's right, I haven't ridden light rail there. <laughs> It's still a different type of technology, um, you know, other than a subway. So uh, let's have a look at uh, what types the what types of light rail they are, because light rail is actually a really uh, loose definition. Um, so when people think of light rail, normally it's usually this type of thing above ground. Uh, this thing is uh, called AGT, automatic guided transit, and um, you can see it. And this is Lines four. Uh, there's two types. You've got the rubber wheeled, which you used in Wee Jungle as well, and then you've got the steel wheeled. Uh, this is the new Incheon Line 2, which opened, um, which has also been plagued with problems, but I think it's still operating okay. Uh, Ever Line is also one of these ones. Uh, Tegu, for their Line 3, they decided not to build the subway and went for a monorail. Um, and it's pr pretty good, I think. It's about 23 kilometers long and uh, weaves in and out through the buildings. So if you're in Tegu, it's be pretty good to, to see the city. Uh, the magnet, which I mentioned, uh, obviously moves using magnets, magnetic levitation. Uh, it kind of goes nowhere. Um, it's free to ride. <laughs> um, the aim of the project is for it to uh, go to a, a tourist area. Um, on Yongzhongdo where the, where the airport is, but um, yeah, still being, still being built. Um, now, when some people, when they think of maglev, they think of super fast trains, but that's why this is called an urban maglev. It's, it's more of a maglev designed for an urban environment. PRT, personal, personal rapid transit, this funny little, little thing. Uh, Skycube is in Sunchan. It was built for the World Garden Expo. Um, held a couple of years ago down there, um, and it wasn't ready in time for the expo, unfortunately. Um, but they did manage to get it open temporarily, I think, um, halfway through, and then officially opened it again later. Um, so this is another good example of Korea actually experimenting using different technologies. Um, there's not actually too many PRT systems uh, in operation around the world. So um, Now speaking of technologies, one thing you'll notice about these new lines that are popping up is that they're all automated. There's no one driving them. Um, and this isn't limited just to light rail. Also, the Shin Pundang line uh, from Kangnam, which goes down to Pundang and also Suwon now, um, that's automated too. And Korea's really getting good at this. And it's actually second worldwide uh, in terms of automated lines. Um, and again, they're going to come first soon because um, Corel has just signed an MOU with Hyundai Rotem uh, to automate some of their lines. They didn't say which ones, but so, uh, but for example, maybe the uh, Suin line from Suwon to Incheon, maybe they'll automate that. Um, so yeah, I think more and more we're going to see uh, less drivers and more uh, automated systems. But why, why the change to light rail? Um, well, it's difficult to point out exactly, especially because there's a lot of different types of light rail. It really depends. Um, generally, it's going to be lower cost. It can be up to a third cheaper in some cases. Um, they use less energy, uh, reduced noise to uh, construction time, and more efficient. Uh, so even though sometimes with light rail, rail uh, the vehicles are maybe smaller, 
they might operate at more frequent intervals. Um, especially for some of these cities, heavy rail can be um, a bit, you know, a bit too, too much for the city, whereas buses still don't cut it. So light rail is a good comprom compromise in the middle. For the future. Um, so there's a lot of cool projects coming up in Korea. Um, this isn't one of them. <laughs> but yeah, um, one thing we do at Kojix is we look at you know what's coming up and you know we get really excited about these things happening. One thing to know about um, future projects in Korea is that a lot of the time we'll say, hey, this is opening you know um, in two years, and it will open five years later. Um, so it always pays to be uh, cautious when, especially if you're, you're thinking of buying land or something involving, um, you know, obviously people try and buy land around uh, future subway lines and stuff. Um, make, sure, make sure the plans are confirmed before you, you go ahead with that because um, very often uh, plans do get uh, changed or even cancelled. Uh, now, there was one type of light rail we hadn't talked about, and that's trams, back to trams. Um, now, there's quite a few cities actually looking at bringing the tram back. Um, so, following from light rail's rise, we're now seeing um, some cities looking at trams, and one that is confirmed to open in 2018 is the Tangua Tram Route. So, this will be the first one. Or going according to plan. It's a very short one, um, but it'll definitely help uh, the workers in, in Pangyo get from the station to the um, to their offices. And so this this tram will run through um, kind of the pedestrian areas. So it won't, it won't necessarily be a, a crossroads, but it won't be a long road. It'll actually, be going around pedestrian areas. Uh, Taejong have confirmed that the line 2 is not going to be a subway, it's not going to be a maglev, which was also suggested. Um, it's going to be a tram. Now, this was a controversial decision down there. A lot of people were against it. Um, people are kind of scared of trams. They're also scared of uh, losing road space, drivers. Um, but they've gone ahead with it, and eventually um, it will be a loop. We go Shinso Line is a planned one for Seoul, going through the heart of Gangnam actually, and looking up to the Han Hanam uh, city. So we get Shindoshi, we get a new city. Um, this one is planned, but a company just pulled out, and another company said they're going to try and help. So yeah, again, <coughs> you just got to keep your eye on it. Suwon said that they won't build a tram. So nothing's happened there, but hopefully they do. And Chong has also said they want to build a tram. And also Dongtan. Um, this one's looking a bit more promising. Um, there's an article recently saying um, they're looking at starting construction in a couple of years. So um, it's really interesting to see these cities um, coming back to, to trams. Obviously, the technology is a lot different now, and uh, they, they look a lot better, work a lot better um, than they did in the old days. So, it we, would be definitely great to see them back. Now, for, for um, a couple of other projects coming up, um, this one isn't your typical public transport, this is more uh, national rail, but I thought I'd bring it up today. Um, High Speed Rail in Gangnam is opening next month. Uh, tickets actually went on sale today. And it's called the SRT. Uh, and it's operated by a company SR, which is a subsidiary of CoRail. Uh, and it means that you can now get you know, KTX type trains uh, from Susa in Gangnam to Busan or Hangzhou, Mokpo. Um, so I know that when I lived in Gangnam, you know, it was a, a real pain to get up to Seoul Station um, whenever I got the train, so it's definitely going to um, be a big help. There are also plans to extend that to Samsung Station, you know, where Coex is. Um, 
as well. Soul has a lot of plans as well. Uh, what this image up here uh, shows is kind of areas where you can walk to a subway station within 10, ten minutes. So there's a lot of gaps there, they want to fill those gaps in. So again, they're planning a lot of lines, but some of these are still quite far off. Nevertheless, there are still quite a few projects opening in the next ten, two years. Uh, on their line in Busan, which is just basically commuter rail. So it's getting its first light rail line, but uh, until now all the light rail has been in other cities, uh, not actually in Seoul. Um, so that's going from Shinseul, Dong to Ui, Korea. Uh, well, that funny what way we do a monorail thing. Um, rail to Pyeongchang, very important for the Olympics. Um, which will mean train straight from the airport to Pyeongchang. Um, and they better hope they can get that done on time. Uh, and Sosa to Wanshi, the line in Kyungido, and Kimko. City of Kimko, there's a lot of development there. They're also getting their own um, subway line. So those are all the brand new things just in two years. Um, that's excluding, excluding all that extensions to current lines that are also planned. So there's always a ton of stuff going on. So if you're ever curious, please you know, check our website. Um, we try to update it when we can. We started with um, showing pictures from the train in Seoul and other places in Korea. And also we want to conclude this presentation with showing a picture of a possible, well, let's say, not really possible, a future model or um, future picture of the tram in Seoul. So the Seoul Institute um, actually developed a couple of years ago this concept of reintroducing trams on the streets of Seoul and then will be included with um, wider sidewalks and more public spaces. And it's more or less now we came like a full circle from we started the presentation with talking about the old tram in Seoul, how we moved the bus into the subways, and now we have this very special and unique mix of um, buses and subways running together. But as Andy shows, the future is more or less now light rail is introduced, buses are going to decrease in the future, and maybe, who knows, I love this concept. I, I really love, love this concept because it's more like a human scale. It's more um, for for the user. For because not, not everything is about efficiency, about moving fast through the city. It's also about experience and the adventure of traveling through the neighborhoods. And the tram, <coughs> or like on street public transport, is one of the most exciting ways, in my opinion. So yeah, let's see whenever this comes. Maybe even. 2100 or something or later. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, follow us on Facebook and such things. And we are open to any questions. Yes, are there any questions? Um, my question is about finances and, and money. Where does the where do the funds come from to do all of this construction? And um, are the public transportation systems underwritten? I mean, when when we get on and we pay our fare, does that does it break even? Does it make a profit, or does it also have to be subsidized? Um, I'll talk a little bit. Um, Funding really depends on what type of project it is. Some of them are completely government funded with a mix of, so for example, from the central government, you know, from the from the city, from the district, and and so it won't just be one place covering the whole whole cost. Um, other times, uh, recently, there's actually been um, a lot more privately funded lines. So for example, you've got like line nine in Seoul, um, which is 
a private company. Uh, the Shin Kundang line as well is also um, a private company. Even though they're integrated into the network, um, that's the reason why um, Line 9 had issues with um, people paying people paying more to write on it. Um, and there's a big fuss about that actually. Line 9 was, the opening was delayed because they couldn't set the price. So um, there were just issues over there. Um, with uh, whether the cost is already covered, and, um, I was just going to say with CoRail, um, CoRail is, has been in a big major deficit um, for many years. Um, you know, transport prices here are quite cheap um, compared to other cities, um, and if they put up, um, people get angry. Um, but yeah, it's it's a real deficit. But probably thinking of public transit systems that make profit in the world, not only in Korea. The only thing I can think of is, is Hong Kong. Hong Kong makes a lot of profit with the uh, like, um, metro system because they own land and they, you know, they develop this land. They then uh, give this to tenants, like shopping malls, and they own like all department stores. Like the metro uh, company owns all metro stores, and so they make more money, not so much through collecting fares and such things. And in my personal opinion, I think public transport is not there to make a profit. You know, it's more like a public good, it's more like a basic public... It's, for me, moving or having mobility is a basic human right and we should be allowed to, or like able to travel wherever we want by using public transportation. And if the system wouldn't exist and we all would have need to put down money for, for a car, we would have need to park this car and you know we would, would it would cost so much more money than actually and even like the environmental issues. So the loss, like the financial loss that Seoul makes, they still get a lot of other other kind of benefits, social benefits by for example like elderly they ride for free. It's a huge minus for the city but it allows elderly to be socially, economically still active in certain ways. And then environmentally, you know, it reduces the pollution that's still worse but it reduces like, many of the negative impacts that we would have been much worse if we didn't have public transportation. Yeah. Uh, the companies are making a fuss because those of us who are 65 in Korea get free rides. And you know anything about that? So they want to raise the limit yes. to 70. Uh, because they are losing a lot. Mm. I mean, they are definitely not making profit. Yes, yes, it's a lot. Yeah. Do you think that will work? Will, will the age go up? Uh, I think it's the same as this, you know, raise the retirement age in many countries and many countries. This kind of thing is Still, you know, they try to decrease a little bit the financial burden, um, but you know, also like from a previous statement, I think, in my personal opinion, they shouldn't do it. I think subsidy-based system it has to be, and you know, there's also much more subsidies that we put into private cars, and even though we pay a lot. I think raising the age limit from 65 to 70, and then maybe later, who knows, when. Um, even more, it's not the best thing. It's more advantageous to give subsidies to have more this kind of benefits. Yeah, I, I have seen the attitude of some younger people um, advocating that you know, um, people who currently get free rides uh, should be paying at least something um, because they know about this loss. Um, <coughs> But yeah, um, in my opinion, my opinion is the same as Nicholas actually. Um, I think it's actually a, a really great thing about Korea that um, the elderly can um, ride the subway for free here. Yeah.
can just point out it's Koreans in 65 in free travel. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 My brother Anthony here. I'm okay. Yes, sir. I come from the UK and we take an enormous amount of time to decide whether to build new train lines because we have public inquiries and all that sort of thing. Um, I don't get a sense, but I'm, I'm speaking from ignorance, that there's a lot of consultation that goes on with various stakeholders before the lines are built here. Am I wrong there? Because one advantage, of course, is that things get done pretty quickly, but a disadvantage could be that there's impact on things like the environment. So how does that work here? Um, I personally actually don't think the opposite because uh, in New Zealand where I'm from, it takes forever um, to build something or to get a project done because there's too much consultation. Exactly, that's my yeah, problem. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I may not have made that clear. Yeah, that's my problem so, in the UK. Yeah. Um, here, yeah, I, I think there's kind of less consultation and kind of let's get on with it. Um, but are there stakeholders who sit there and think, why didn't you ask me? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then there's always, um, so for example, I talked about before on the page on the, the tram and stuff. People have been protesting about that uh, in the street. So there are definitely people who, who get unhappy when some of these lines just kind of go ahead. Um, or aren't as they were, they were originally promised. Um, yeah, but in Korea, there's definitely a. Um, and let's just get yeah, it done. Can yeah. you see that change anytime soon? Yeah. What, like, will it slow down with more consultation? Yeah, or that's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, I feel there might have been a bit more recently. What do you think? The current mayor, Park Won Sun, is a good example of. He says, open ear, and he has like, this poster with this ear, so he, he tries to consult with, more with um, the citizens and with um, the people. So I think maybe, and others, because he's such a popular leader, so other mayors, other political leaders are following his, his approach and at least have, trying to have a better image and trying to pretend to be more. <laughs> and also, like, you've got a new point. Um, from my personal experience, I live since a couple of years close to the Shimbundan line, so already I saw the construction and everything, I saw it slowly popping up. And the only, some of the most important consultation from the point of people who lived there was the name of the station. Mm -hmm. So people could actually submit their ideas how to name the stations, and they had some kind of, of course, not the final decision, but they could. You know, live it, have some influence on the name. Because then the name is also something very important. It can decide about if the real estate prices or like the price there increase or maybe decrease if the name is something something bad or if it's associated with something, you know, prosperity or something. Because it has lots of uh, influence. There was like a huge, in my area, huge battle uh, of naming the station Kwangyo, York. And then there was another station that also wants to name that's the same name, which is actually closer to Kwangyo. We are not so much Kwangyo actually, like Kwangyo Shendoshi and the northern part of the one. But somehow we got the name, I don't know why, and then. <laughs> and so the other, the, the other area was the angry about this. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's a good point. Um, these days there are a ton of naming competitions. Um, for new lines, it's happened the same thing with the new high speed rail, the SRT. They also put out surveys and consultation for that. Um, also for, for things like the app. So not necessarily the actual building of the line, but other elements that there seems to be a lot more consultation uh, going on. Um, it's funny that Nicola mentions about the name of the station. Um, our most popular article was the. Um, on our website was the change of the name of Shinchanga to, um, I actually forget the new name now, Chamshir, can somebody remember it? Chamshir, no, it wasn't Chamshir, no, that was another one that changed. But basically the reason is there, they didn't want the name Shinchan anymore because it didn't have Chamshir in it. So they wanted Chamshir in the name of their station because again, it raises house prices. Yeah. That, that's the stuff which people seem to be more worried about. <laughs>
uh, I have a question about the uh, self-driving car and uh, car sharing in the future. I have read an article about 20 years later, the, probably the position of the cars will decrease by 10 percent to, well, in the future, 20, uh, 20 years later. Probably car sharing and the self-driving car also should impact to our uh, transportation system as well as environment. What do you, what kind of impact to that uh, self-driving car and the car sharing to our the transportation system and the environment in the future? What, what is your opinion? Actually, there have been studies saying, like the studies say, ninety percent, like automated driving, automated cars could take off ninety percent of our car traffic from the roads. Everything would be completely shared, and ninety percent is a lot. It's um, yeah, so not really clear when it's going to come. Maybe ten years, twenty years, faster than maybe imagined for many people. Um, the thing. Probably still huge issue in Korea is road safety, the number of accidents, and then this would, I think, drastically, you know, if we would really implement a full automated uh, driving environment where nobody's driving anymore, like not a mixed environment, really, not, everything is automated. It would completely, like in utopia, like limit, <coughs> uh, uh, the, make the human error disappear. And we would not have any major accidents anymore. Like, still, every day there are hundreds of accidents in Korea. When, like, compared to other OECD countries, still has Korea's high accident rates, and rise, highest fatality, and highest um, injury rates. So that's, I think, probably the biggest impact that we will see. And then, I think, like, car ownership, that we don't have, need to actually own the cars anymore. But that's also something for the future. It all depends a lot on how the policymakers decide. And um, then the third impact probably was environmental. If automated vehicles are more like electric vehicles, then it would be good for the environment. And even if they are fuel based vehicles, then still, because automated, they would be more efficient about driving and then make a better job about this, to make it also safe you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, we have to be out of here by 9 o'clock, so <laughs> short.